Between the 1st and 2nd of August, 1946, a fierce battle broke out between the civilians of a small town in Tennessee and members of its corrupt local government. The Battle of Athens, also known as the McMinn County War, took place as citizens consisting of mainly World War II veterans finally stood up to the local officials, who they had accused of police brutality, corruption, and voter intimidation. Ten years earlier, in 1936, a man named Paul Cantrell was elected sheriff of Athens, Tennessee, thanks in large part to the influence of E.H. Boss Crump, who had controlled the majority of Tennessee politics for almost 50 years. Cantrell was re-elected in 1938 and again in 1940. He served in the state senate in 1942 and 1944, while his deputy, Pat Mansfield, was elected sheriff in his absence. In 1941, a state law was enacted that reduced local opposition to members of Crump's organization, including the mayor of Athens. The sheriff and his deputies were paid under a system whereby they would receive a fee for every person they arrested, jailed, and released. Tourists and travelers were the main targets. Buses passing through the county would be pulled over, and passengers falsely ticketed for drunkenness, whether they showed signs of drunkenness or not. Cantrell engaged in election fraud, both by intimidating voters that voted against him, people that had died were kept on the voter roll, and he would allow their ballots to be counted. The US Department of Justice had investigated McMinn County for election fraud since 1940, but had decided to take no action. The political problems were exacerbated by the politicians encouraging gambling, bootlegging, and other illegal activity. Most of McMinn County's young men were off fighting in the Second World War, allowing the appointment of several ex-convicts as sheriff's deputies. The local county government not only controlled law enforcement, it also controlled newspapers and schools. When asked if the local newspaper, the Daily Post-Athenian, supported the GIs, veteran Bill White replied, No, they didn't help us none. Deputy Mansfield had complete control of everything schools and everything else. You couldn't even get hired as a school teacher without their okay, or any other job. During the war, two servicemen home on leave were shot and killed by Cantrell supporters. Upon hearing of this, local men serving the war told friends they couldn't wait to return home and do something about it. When the GIs did return home, they were often targeted for harassment by the deputies. In the August 1946 election, Paul Cantrell once again ran for sheriff, while Pat Mansfield ran for state senate. After the end of World War II, around 3,000 soldiers returned home to McMinn County. They made up almost 10% of the county's population. Some of these veterans resolved to overturn Cantrell's corrupt regime by fielding non-partisan candidates in local elections. Bill White described the veterans' motivation. There were several beer joints and honky-tonks around Athens. We were pretty wild. We started having trouble with the law enforcement at the time because they started making habit of picking up GIs and fining them heavily for most anything. They were kind of making a racket out of it. After long hard years of service, most of us were hardcore veterans of World War II, and we were used to drinking our liquor and our beer without being molested. When these things happened, the GIs got madder. The more GIs they arrested, the more they beat up, the madder we got. The members of the GI Nonpartisan League were careful to ensure their candidates matched the county's demographics and nominated three Republicans and two Democrats. Knox Henry, a respected and decorated veteran of the North African campaign, ran for sheriff against Cantrell. On August 1st, polls opened for the county election. Normally, about 15 police would be on duty. This time, however, over 200 armed deputies were on hand. A GI poll watcher asked for a ballot box to be opened to ensure it was empty. Although this was a legal request, he was promptly arrested and taken to jail. In Athens, another man protested irregularities in the election and he too was arrested and charged with what he was told was 
a federal offence. At around 3pm that day, one of the policemen, C.M. Wise, prevented an elderly farmer named Tom Gillespie from casting his ballot at the Athens Waterworks polling station. He struck the farmer with brass knuckles, causing Gillespie to drop his ballot and run from the deputy. Wise promptly shot Gillespie in the back. In response, the GIs gathered in front of the office of their campaign manager. He had petitioned the Governor of Tennessee and the US Attorney General for help in ensuring a lawful election, but his plea went unheard. When the group learned that Sheriff Mansfield had stationed armed guards at all polling stations, they decided to arm themselves. Sheriff Mansfield arrived at the waterworks and declared the polling over. In the ensuing commotion, Wise and another deputy took two poll watchers captive. According to separate eyewitness accounts, the two eventually escaped by either jumping through a glass window or through a door. Wise followed them and shot at them, causing the gathered crowd to run for cover. Someone in the crowd yelled, Let's go get our guns! causing the crowd to head for the GI's campaign office. Deputy Chief Bo Dunn took the two deputies and the ballot box to the jail. Two other deputies were dispatched to arrest the two escaped poll watchers. They were disarmed by the GI's, as were other deputies on the scene. At the 12th Precinct polling station, another violent incident occurred, again involving the mistreatment of poll watchers. One of Mansfield's men, a man named Minus Wilburn, attempted to let a young woman, who one of the watchers believed was underage, cast her vote. Although she did not have a poll tax receipt and was not on the voter registry, Wilburn wanted to accept her vote. When the poll watcher tried to intervene, Wilburn struck him on the head with a blunt weapon and kicked him in the face. The deputies then arrested the GIs and, as happened at the waterworks, took the ballot box across the street to the jail. In response to the police brutality, Bill White, one of the leaders of the GIs, instructed an, another member to take some men and break into the nearby National Guard armory to steal weapons. They took the keys from the armory's caretaker and entered the building. They acquired 60 30 6 Enfield rifles, two Thompson submachine guns and ammunition. These were then distributed to each of the 60 GIs. As the polls closed and counting began, minus the boxes sitting in the jail, the GI-backed candidates held a 3-to-1 lead. While the GIs recognised they had broken the law by stealing the weapons, and the fact that Cantrell's reinforcements would arrive in the morning, they decided to act quickly. They took up position on the second floor of a bank across the street from the jail. By 9 p.m., Cantrell, along with Mansfield and George Woods, the Speaker of the State House of Representatives and Secretary of the McMinn County Election Commission, and about 50 deputies were in the jail, rummaging through the confiscated ballot boxes. Woods and Mansfield constituted a majority of the Election Commission and could therefore certify and validate the count from the jail. Estimates of the number of veterans laying siege to the jail differed from several hundred to as high as 2,000. The veterans demanded the return of the ballot boxes, but were refused. They then opened fire on the jail, initiating a firefight that lasted several hours, by some accounts. An attempt by deputies outside the jail to reinforce or take refuge in the jail were thwarted by Bill White's band of 60 GIs. Some people in the jail managed to escape through the back door. For the veterans, it was a case of win before morning, or lose and face a very long time in jail. It was rumoured that the National Guard and state troopers were on their way. The veterans made frequent demands for the deputies to surrender, and tried to launch Molotov cocktails, but couldn't throw them far enough to reach the jail. Around this time, an ambulance pulled up to the jail. The veterans thought it was there to treat the wounded. Instead, both Cantrell and Mansfield jumped in and were sped away to safety. Feeling frustrated, 
the veterans decided to deploy dynamite. As with the Molotov cocktails, however, they could not be thrown far enough to impact the jail. Instead, landing on nearby cars, scattering debris near the jail walls. In the end, the door to the jailhouse was dynamited, and the deputies surrendered. The ballot boxes were recovered. The New York Times reported that the night was bloody, and that it ended after the GIs detonated three homemade demolition charges. When the GIs entered the jail, they found evidence of ballot tampering by Cantrell's forces. However, after the final tally was complete, Knox Henry was elected sheriff. During the firefight at the jail, rioting had broken out on the streets of Athens, mainly targeting police cars. Many were destroyed. During the riots, the mayor of Athens was away on vacation, and the police were nowhere to be found. The GIs called a meeting on the morning of August 2nd. George Woods, who had escaped the night before, sent a message that he would recognise Knox Henry as the sheriff. The GIs said they would hold control of McMinn County until September 1st, when Henry was due to be sworn in. The recovered ballots recorded a landslide for the five GI non-partisan league candidates. The gambling houses that colluded with Cantrell's regime were raided and their operations ceased. Deputies of the prior administration resigned and were replaced. In the end, Knox Henry defeated Paul Cantrell by 2,175 votes to 1,270.